evening and welcome to this Logger Lecture online. My name is Jessica Lansbury and I work in the Office of Alumni Engagement here at McMaster. Over the next two years, our Logger Lecture series of webinars will feature talks on some of the research taking place at McMaster University that is helping reach the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals and their targets. The Sustainable Development Goals are a call to action to end poverty and hunger, protect the planet, and ensure healthy lives, peace, and prosperity by the year 2030. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Bonnie Ibowo, Professor of History and Global Human Rights here at McMaster. His research interests are global human rights, peace conflict studies, legal, and imperial history. He has taught in universities in Africa, Europe, and North America. Previously, he was a Human Rights Fellow at the Carnegie, Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs, New York, and Research Fellow at the Danish, Danish Institute for Human Rights, Copenhagen. If you would like to ask a question this evening, please type it in using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will have some time to answer a few questions at the end of, end of the formal presentation. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Iboa as he explores the challenges of global conflicts and the urgent need for peace and justice interventions to foster a more peaceful and inclusive world as envisioned in United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number 16, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica, for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be back in this series and I look forward to our conversation uh, this evening. I'd like to share my screen if I can. I, had a, I have a few images uh, to share uh, with you today. Um, do you have my screen shared? Do I have my screen shared at this point? Yep. Yes, we can see that. Oh, great. So I'll just play from the beginning there. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my talk today centers on the challenges of global peace uh, and conflict, uh, of, of promoting peace in, uh, in our conflicted world today. Uh, it is always a pleasure to speak to a diverse audience about peace and justice. Uh, one feels a sense of urgency, an impulse to seize the moment, uh, an exceptional opportunity. Uh, we live in a world where a uh, 24-hour news cycle is dominated by questions of conflict. Uh, an opportunity to pause and reflect on the prospects for peace offers a constructive and welcome diversion. Uh, talks relating to peace often attract the same group of people students, scholars, activists, people with interest in peace studies and social justice issues. Uh, sometimes one gets the feeling of preaching to the choir, you know, those who are already convinced about the justification of the cause. So it is particularly gratifying today uh, to speak to a more diverse congregation rather than just the familiar choir to continue with the metaphor of the church. What I propose to do in my talk today is to go beyond the inherent value of peace. We already know that war is bad, peace is good. I want to question why in a conflicted world, the virtues of peace and the ideals of harmonious coexistence seem to continue to elude us. I ask what practical solutions peace building and conflict transformation as an ideology and a movement can offer us in a world increasingly defined by violence and conflict. I propose to speak to four key things today. The first is the reality of a conflicted world, explaining and discussing the place we find ourselves today as a global community. The second is the appeal of pragmatic pacifism as a solution to the challenges of a conflicted world, sustainable peace building, and finally, cultivating cultures of peace. But let me start with a question. Let me start with a preliminary question. 
And this is a question that peace and conflict studies scholars often ponder. Is the world a more peaceful place today than it was a hundred years ago? Did the generations that came before us have a more peaceful time than we have today in our world? The answers to these questions obviously depend on where one lives in the world. You know, if you live in Western Europe today, you will be living in one of the most peaceful societies in the world. But only 70 years ago, amidst the chaos and devastation of the Second World War, Western Europe was one of the most conflict reading parts of the world. The original sites of both the First and the Second World Wars where untold atrocities were committed and millions were killed. But you see, the factual and evidence-based answer to the question as just posed is that even though it doesn't appear to be the case, we are in fact living in a generally more peaceful society today than say a hundred years ago. But that claim comes with an important caveat, and I will explain that here. So the Institute of Economics and Peace, an American policy think tank, issues an annual global peace index, which uses a variety of indicators to score and rank peacefulness in 162 countries around the world. In its 2021 report, it made the following claims. One, that since 2008, the level of global peacefulness has deteriorated by 2%. That the average level of global peacefulness has also deteriorated for nine of the past 13 years. That ongoing conflicts deteriorated by 6.2%, and safety and security deteriorated by 2.5%. But interestingly, it also claims that conflicts that emerged in the past decade have begun to abate only to be replaced with a new wave of tension and uncertainty as a result of COVID-19 pandemic and rising tensions between many of the world's major powers. So here is a contradiction that it talks about the deterioration of peacefulness, but yet talks about wars and conflicts abating. And this forces us to think about the tragedy of conflict and the real impact of conflict in our societies. I want to start my conversation today with some of these questions. Fewer wars, less peace. So if we are to read the data on the Global Peace Index, it's telling us that yes, there are fewer wars than there were say 100 years ago, but there's less peace in the world today. How can that be? How exactly do wars and peace decline at the same time? How can we have fewer wars and yet less peace. The obvious and simple answer is that peace is not the absence of war. But there is a more complicated answer. Peace or peaceability is more complex and a more complicated phenomenon. I will return to this question later on and it will be the trust of my talk today. In our 24-hour media circle, it is difficult to escape the stark and often depressing reality that we live in troubled times. One gets the impression that the world is caving in around us, especially with the pandemic and the social and economic disruptions that have been brought about by the pandemic. A combination of domestic social disruptions and global political upheavals pose serious threats to the stability of local communities, the integrity of states, and a fragile international order. In the Middle East, the promise of the Arab Spring has not only failed to materialize, but has in some countries ushered a dark age of brutality and human misery. 
The fall of long-standing dictatorships have triggered political instability and upheaval from Libya to Yemen. In Syria, a protracted civil war rages, a situation made worse by the role of extremist groups such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS. An estimated 300,000 Syrians, a quarter of a million people, have lost their lives since the start of that conflict. We must remind ourselves that these are not just numbers. 300,000 lives. That is about the half the population of our city, Hamilton. In pondering this figure, 300 million lives, I am reminded of that cynical quote by Stalin, the debt of one man is a tragedy. The debt of millions is merely a statistic. At some point, we lose count. The jolt becomes a blur and the shock value dissipates. Lost lives become simply numbers. The disheartening images of thousands of Syrian refugees streaming into Europe and living under squalid conditions reflects the international repercussions of these conflicts. Who can forget the heart-wrenching image of the three-year-old Syrian boy, Alan Kurdi, whose little buddy washed up on a beach in Turkey only a few years ago. His family was making a final desperate attempt to flee the war in Syria to join relatives in Europe amidst the refugee crisis. It is said that Ellen had family here in Canada and that the ultimate goal of this fleeing family was to reunite with their families here in Canada. Ellen never made it like many others. Migration charities say that as many as 30,000 people have died at sea trying to reach Europe in the last two decades. When I see these striking images of Lidio Elian Kurdi, I wonder why it became so evocative for us. I think it became so evocative for many of us in the West in that we could relate to this child, but for the fact that he's lying face down, lifeless on the beach, he looks like the kid next door or the kid playing in the neighborhood park. He's well-dressed, wearing shoes, and the background is a beach, a space we have come to associate with relaxation, tranquility, and fun. It is not a photo of some impoverished child in some distant and unfamiliar corner of the world, in some conflict zone somewhere. This brought home the face of war and conflict. It is, in my view, more graphic than any image of combat could be. The cost of war. Afghanistan. After $2 trillion and 20 years of occupation and fighting, the United States finally left Afghanistan only a few weeks ago. It is estimated that at least 800,000 people have been killed by direct violence in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Pakistan since the beginning of that conflict. The number of people who have been wounded or have fallen ill as a result of the conflict is far higher as is the number of civilians who've died indirectly as a result of the destruction of hospitals and infrastructure and environmental contamination among other war-related problems. In a sign of how troubled the Middle East has become, the Israeli-Palestinian issue long considered the central peace and security question in the region seemed to have taken a backseat in the face of more urgent and grave threats to regional and global security. Only recently in Ukraine, local identity politics and big power geopolitics 
triggered a civil war that threatened the post-Cold War peace and stability of Eastern Europe. In Pakistan and Kashmir, militants continue in a long-running insurgency that has resulted in the loss of thousands of lives. In North Africa, there continues to be tension in the Western Sahara and in the new nation of South Sudan, which remains embroiled in conflict. Ethiopia is currently locked in conflict with separatists in the Tigray region of that country. In West Africa, the militant Islamist group Boko Haram has unleashed terror and indiscriminate violence against civilians, including innocent school children. In Asia, the nuclear threat posed by North Korea remains unresolved, while territorial ambition of a resurgent China raises political tension and new security concerns in the region. From Myanmar to Thailand in Asia to Colombia in South America, states and societies remain embroiled in internal conflicts and militant insurgencies that adversely affect the daily lives of ordinary people. Even in the relatively stable Western democracies, tensions seem just beneath the surface. In Europe, irregular migration of refugees, fleeing wars in the Middle East and in North Africa has given rise to a resurgent xenophobia and the rise of right-wing extremism and exclusionary populist nationalism reminiscent of the pre-Second World War era. And we can see this today in the kind of extremist rhetoric coming out of Viktor Orban's Hungary. In the United States, the civil rights legacy of Reverend Martin Luther King and his struggle for inclusion and racial injustice has found new voice in the Black Lives Matter movement. Here in Canada, where we have a relatively peaceful democracy that we are thankful for, we still have to reckon with the atrocities of colonialism. The Residential Schools Truth and Reconciliation Commission painted a disturbing picture of continued alienation and exclusion of indigenous communities that challenge us as, uh, as individuals and a society to confront and address the monumental historical injustices perpetuated against First Nations. But the crises and conflicts that beset us as a global community are not limited to wars. The imperative of peace is not just one involving political conflicts. It is also relevant to addressing the global climate and ecological crisis. Climate change has made weather conditions extreme threatening lives, livelihood, and lifestyles, exacerbating competition for resources. Floods, droughts, heat waves, hurricanes, and other forms of extreme weather events trigger conflicts, putting millions of people all in all regions of the world at risk of losing their homes, being killed, injured, or not having enough food to eat, or water to drink. For example, the rise of Islamist militants in the Sahel has been linked to drought and desertification and food insecurity, which has imperiled traditional pastoral lifestyles, forcing young idle men into armed militancy and extremism. So there is a direct correlation between climate change and the rise of conflicts in our world. It is a correlation that is often not made. We also see this correlation between climate change and conflict in the current tension between Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan over Ethiopia's ongoing plans to build a large dam on the Nile. And the building of this dam will definitely affect the volume of water flowing downwards to Egypt. Egypt has historically relied heavily on the Nile, and many people worry that the current political tension over Ethiopia's damming of the Nile to get more water resources from the Nile, if not resolved diplomatically, 
could lead to a war between the two countries. So there you find the most obvious connection between climate change and the scarcity of water resources and potential conflicts. We know that unless there is immediate rapid and large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, this situation will soon become too severe to remedy. To save our planet and save humanity from the conflicts that will inevitably arise from climate change and the intense competition for natural resources that will inevitably follow, we need to change current attitudes of wasteful consumerism. All this is to say that a healthy and sustainable environment is a prerequisite for a peaceful world. It is becoming commonly accepted that economic production, what we call gross domestic production, product, GDP, as a measure of economic growth must be complemented with inclusive wealth. And by inclusive wealth, I mean the sum of some total of produced human and natural capital, which takes into account the health of the environment and is a better measure of whether national economic policies are sustainable for today's youth and for future generations. Indeed, it is ironic that in a bipolar Cold War world of superpowers, nuclear proliferation and the threat of mutually assured destruction now seems more stable than a fragmented unipolar world. At the end of the Cold War, the end of the Cold War was expected to usher in an era of unmitigated peace, world peace. For those in the West, finally, they could emerge from our fear and distrust of the communists, foe, do away with the bomb shelters, eliminates the siren drills and embrace each other in a spirit of brotherhood. We hoped we could hold hands, sing choruses of Kumbaya and live happily ever after. Some optimists like the political scientist Francis Fukuyama even proclaimed the end of history with the end of the Cold War, while others warned of an impending clash of civilizations. As a graduate student in the 1990s, considering an academic career in international human rights and conflict studies, I was often cautioned that the study of peace and global conflict might not be relevant in the future. While the imminent collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of communism, and the end of the Cold War unfolded, it was thought that there will be no more wars to worry about. There will be no more need to study peace. But today we look back and we see that the study of conflicts and the attempts to address them remain as relevant as ever. So let me return to the question that I posed at the beginning of this talk. How do we explain the odd reality that we have fewer wars and yet less peace? How exactly do wars and peace decline at the same time? I will propose an explanation, and this is an explanation that others have shared. There might be many more. The first is what I call the democratization of conflict. Although large-scale militarized conflicts between nations and states are becoming less frequent in the post-Cold War world, there has been a spike in internal conflicts and civil wars. As noted earlier, global peacefulness has been steadily falling for the past seven years. And over 500 million people currently live in countries at risk of further declines in peacefulness, both in the short term and in the long term. This is principally because War is no longer the preserve of national armies and sovereign powers. Non-state actors increasingly have the capacity to wage sustained armed conflict, thereby reducing overall peacefulness around the world. This takes the form of domestic terrorism, insurgencies, rebellion, revolts, and uprisings. In other words, we have fewer wars and less peace today because conflict has become democratized. Everyone can now wage war. 
It is easier today for non-state actors such as militant insurgent groups with no fixed address to unleash wide-scale violence than at the height of the Cold War. Today, the weapons of mass destruction are not confined to state armories. They are also in the hands of terrorists, insurgents, and unregulated militias who have no qualms about deploying these weapons indiscriminately. The counterpoint, of course, to the development of the democratization of war is the democratization of peace. Like war, peace is also becoming more democratic. Today, peacefulness is as much about what happens between people within communities and inside national borders as it is about armies and wars. Breakdowns in peacefulness are becoming more decentralized and peacefulness relies more heavily on social structures and non-state actors as opposed to exclusively governments and formal militaries. The other explanation I have for this paradox of fewer wars and more peacelessness has to do with the absence of local and global peace movements. While peace may have become more democratic, it has also become less palpable, less tangible. There are fewer global peace movements today than during the Cold War years. Where are the protest marches against the wars in Syria? Where are the protest marches against the wars in Yemen and Afghanistan? Where are the protest songs against torture and indiscriminate drone strikes? Where are the Bob Dylans and the John Lennons of our era? The voices of tolerance and moderation, it seems, have been completely drowned out by the voices of extremism, bigotry, and intolerance. Where are today's peace songs and anti-war songs? In 1963, Bob Dylan gave us Blowing in the Wind. In 1971, John Lennon released Imagine, which became the anthem of the anti-Vietnam War movement. Where are the songs of today against war? Or to in keeping with today's technology, where are the peace apps on mobile phones to inspire today's social media savvy generation? And this is something I've actually researched. I've asked students in my class, are there any apps on your mobile phone? Since there seem to be an app for everything now, are there apps dedicated to the promotion of peace? And often I hear, no, I don't think it exists. Or if they exist, they are so obscure, they're not mainstream. Grassroots apathy and indifference has made, has effectively made us a more dangerous world than a bipolar Cold War world, I argue. And then of course, we can add to these, the reality of toxic form of digital communications as precipitators of conflict, political polarizations, and particularly in an era of pandemic. Time does not permit me to elaborate on that as a team in growing wave of peacelessness in our world today. And of course, there is the worsening climate and ecological crisis, which triggers even more conflicts that I already alluded to. The question then arises, how exactly can we promote peace in our conflict ridden world? After all, I have stated that war and conflict are no longer the exclusive preserve of national armies or governments or even sovereign powers. I have stated that in an age of asymmetrical warfare, the weapons of mass destruction are no longer confined to state armories. They are also in the hands of terrorists and insurgents. So does it make sense to talk peace with dictators and terrorists and insurgents whose frame of reference are so far removed from conventional norms of decency, civility, and the ethical conduct of war? How do you approach peacekeeping with those who prescribe torture, beheadings, death, simply for dissent? In attempting to answer this question, I share with you today my reflections as a scholar and as an observer of peace movements, guided by the lessons of history and as an invested global citizen 
one who shares the optimism of pragmatic pacifism. So in the few minutes I have left, I want to reflect on how I think we break this cycle. And I'm going to center my proposal for breaking the circles along three things that I started with, the appeal of pragmatic pacifism. In discussing paths to peace in a conflicted world, I'd like to begin with a conversation about pragmatic pacifism. What is pragmatic pacifism? In the decades since the anti-war peace movement of the 1960s, Peacemaking has come to be seen as synonymous with absolute pacifism, what some describe as anarchic pacifism. Absolute pacifism, which is an opposition to war under all circumstances for religious and moral reasons. For those who subscribe to absolute pacifism, there can be no moral grounds that can justify resorting to war. For the absolute pacifists, the rejection of war is unconditional. This moral position will continue to have a place in our conflicted world. Conscientious objectors like the Mennonites and the Jehovah's Witness certainly have their place in our collective quest for world peace. But when people think about peace movements, they invariably think about absolute pacifists. That is not what I am proposing here. What I'm proposing here is a pragmatic pacifism. Within pragmatic pacifism, there is room for humanitarian intervention. The fundamental premise of the post Second World War universal human rights regime, drawn from the lessons of the Holocaust, is that we can no longer allow the excuse of state sovereignty to be used to justify gross human rights violations. No longer can oppressive dictatorship be allowed to massacre their own citizens on the perverted argument that posits these are our own people, we can do with them whatever we want. Universal human rights are the rights to meddle in the business of other countries. Backed by the provisions of the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the doctrine of the responsibility to protect and the doctrine of humanitarian intervention. It is within this framework of the military humanitarian intervention that NATO intervened in Kosovo, Bosnia Herzegovina in the 1990s. So although I, I am pushing for pragmatic pacifism, I think there is a place for humanitarian intervention. There is a space for just war, for pragmatic use of for, for pragmatic use of force to stop mass carnage. But then there is a question that I also want to confront before I end this conversation this evening. What are the guarantees that pragmatic pacifism can provide a solution to conflict in a deeply divided world? Simply, there are no guarantees. The appeal of pragmatic pacifism is that it recognizes that just wars may sometimes be waged in self-defense or in pursuit of peace. And yet it offers the hope of avoiding the scourge and devastation of war. The US President Ronald Reagan, more pragmatist than pacifist himself, faced a similar question when he initiated the nuclear disarmament talk with the Soviet Union in the 1980s. He was confronted by critics and skeptics who worried that the Soviets would not, should not be trusted to keep their own word, to end, the, to, to follow up on the agreements that he had signed. Reagan famously responded, peace is not the absence of conflict, it is the ability to cope with conflict by peaceful means. Despite the gloomy predictions of the skeptics, Reagan's pushed on with the nuclear disarmament talks setting the tone for de-escalation of US-Soviet tension and ultimately the end of the Cold War. The other themes that I'd like to speak to briefly is the concept of sustainable peace building. The concept of sustainable peace building here broadly refers to those conditions that enhance the transition from a state of conflict to coexistence and thus contribute to sustainable peace. We can talk about peace building on two levels. Peace building at the primary level of individuals and local communities and peace building 
at the secondary level of national and international conflict transformation. Peace building and conflict transformation can only be possible when we understand the roots of conflict. Several studies have shown that economic despair, social injustice, and political exclusion are the deepest causes of conflict. As Mahatma Gandhi famously stated, poverty is the worst form of violence. We often do not think about poverty and inequality as violence, but they are ultimate forms of violence. Conflicts erupt within contexts that promote discriminatory policies among diverse ethnic, racial, social, economic, and religious identity groups. Inequality and injustice reinforce competition and opposition between diverse identity groups by creating conditions that prohibit the realization of basic human needs for all people and by reinforcing the sense of relative deprivation. Peace building can therefore be framed as an economic and social justice project. And then finally, cultivating cultures of peace. Ultimately, the key requirement for peace building in our conflicted world is to cultivate cultures of peace at all levels of society. War, once invented, cannot be uninvented. Still, peace is possible if built on decent politics and global cosmopolitan structures. Our collective morality, secular or religious, can reinforce, channel, or deflect aggressive violent desires. As the UNESCO Charter proclaims, war begins in the minds of women and men. It can end there as well. Let me end today's talk with a story that I'm sure some of you may already be familiar with. On Christmas day of 1914, amidst the ruins and devastation of the First World War, a group of British and German infantrymen declared an unlikely truce. In a story that has become to represent the hope and generosity of the human spirit, soldiers on both sides of that war took a break from war to sing Christmas songs and celebrate Christmas day together. They left their trenches to exchange pleasantries and gifts in sub-zero temperatures. By some accounts, they even took time to play a soccer game before returning to their trenches to continue the fighting and killing in the middle of the war. For a fleeting moment during the Great War, peace was possible. A handwritten letter from the British soldier, Gerald Blake, describing the events I just described from the, perception, from the perspective of a participant observer, one who would later be killed in action, is held at McMaster University Library. I often encourage my students to visit the library to see for themselves the original copy of this important document, which we are very privileged to have with us on the McMaster campus. In confronting the conflicts and social upheavals that have come to define our present era, the Christmas truce of 1914 holds three important lessons for peacemaking in our world. One, lesson number one, Peace is always possible. Even in the darkest moments of conflict and bitterness, even in the hostile and dehumanizing trenches of war, peace was possible. Lesson two, ordinary people can be effective peacemakers. Peace initiatives need not always be top down or left to politicians, statesmen, diplomats, and those in high office. Peace can also come from the bottom up through civic engagement and action. The Christmas Truce of 1914 was a spontaneous initiative by weary soldiers in the trenches who desperately wanted a break from war and to reclaim their humanity. Had the generals, monarchs, and politicians had any say in it, that brief truce would never have happened. After all, soldiers are supposed to be fighters, not peacemakers. But peacemaking cannot be the sole prerogative of rulers and warlords in conflict situations. The stakes in war are simply too high to leave to political leaders. And finally, 
The lesson of the Christmas truce of 1914 is that coalitions of ordinary citizens and even the most unlikely common soldiers in war trenches serving as instruments of violence can also be instruments of peace. Unfortunately, the truce of 1914 was short-lived. The war would continue for four more years. But the key lesson for all of us today is that the possibilities of peace are often closer than we realize. I thank you for listening. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Um, just a reminder, if anyone has any questions, um, you can type them into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we will uh, answer a few in the time we have left. Um, so to start off, um, I the first one I had was, how do you see the Indigenous voice across the world and locally fitting into the democratic democratization of peace conflict? Thank you so much for that question. I think indigenous voices are key to us finding a solution because obviously the dominant solutions haven't worked. One of the limitations of uh, the discourse on peace building internationally is that for a very long time, these discourses have been dominated by colonial narratives and colonial pedagogies. Uh, it is only now that there is a growing realization that we need to explore alternative indigenous perspectives to peace building. In the Haudenosaunee traditions, for instance, the great law of peace uh, has not been given the kind of attention that it deserves. I recently reviewed an international book, the bestseller on international peace building, and it had nothing to say, nothing to say about indigenous perspective. Yet we know now uh, that much of the peace initiatives that were put in place, uh, either in constitutional forms, in the case of the United States, uh, the arrangements to keep peace between the early 13 colonies were drawn from indigenous traditions, from the traditions that the early settlers encountered uh, with indigenous peoples on the land. So there is now a growing realization, both in academic circle, but even in policy circles, uh, that the solution for peace in our world has to draw on all traditions. And there is now more research into exploring how indigenous traditions can really guide uh, these concerted efforts that we're making towards ensuring global peace. That's great, thank you. Um, the next question submitted, how can one prevent conflicts when access to resources to, to, to sustain life and, I can, sorry, how can one prevent conflicts when access to resources to sustain life and economies are dwindling? That's a very good question. And I think one of the first things we need to ask ourselves is why are they dwindling in the first place? They're dwindling in the first place is because humanity hasn't managed them effectively. You know, like the famous Mahatma Gandhi quote says, there is enough in the world for everyone's need that just isn't enough for everyone's greed. Uh, the, the, the greed of humanity has put us in this place and we have to unlearn that tradition of boundless consumerism that has made resources scarce. I for one do not believe that the world inherently has scarce resources. I think there is enough resources to sustain life on this planet if we could only live sustainably. And that is why in the discussion I have on questions of peace and conflict, I always like to center the climate and environmental crisis. Uh, politicians like to think about this as two different topics. Are we discussing peace and conflict and wars, or are we discussing climate change and ecological crisis? And I say, no, they're the same. You can have a debate about one without the other. So it seems to me that the solution to that question you just posed is to begin to link peace to the climate and ecological crisis, and to begin to think about how we can change our behavior, 
to address urgent climate change issues like global warming so that we can prevent some of the conflicts that we already seen bubbling up to the surface, conflict over water, conflict over energy, conflict over land as more countries become submerged due to flooding and, and, and global warming. These are all precipitators of conflict and we know they will continue to be. So the answer really is to begin to link peace on earth more to the climate crisis so that there will be a sense of urgency to address them because practically uh, the future of the earth and our ability to survive on this planet we call home depends on how well we live sustainably within it. Great, thank you. Our next one is a comment from a reader um, that says, I just read yesterday that the new constitution of Libya, formulated by a largely female government, is one of the most inclusive in the world, and those who formulated were award the Nobel Prize. Any comments? Yes, uh, I, I, I think that this follows a pattern that if women are given the opportunity uh, to speak, if those who have been marginalized are allowed at the table, uh, chances are they produce a framework that is better than the previous one. And we see this uh, in Europe after the Second World War, the, the constitutions that came out of Europe after the Second World War were some of the most progressive constitutions because people had seen the devastation of war and all these constitutions had elaborate human rights provision. Uh, the constitution that came out in South Africa after apartheid was one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. It has provisions for protection for LGBTQ rights, one of the few constitutions that does that in Africa a very liberal constitution. So I see that happening too in Libya because this is a society that has seen war, has seen conflict. And so there's a yearning by those at the grassroots level to put in place the structures to ensure that those problems do not continue. Now, the question is not just the constitution. The larger question is, will they be implemented? Uh, we know from history that ideas are good, ideas can be created, that you need the force, you need uh, the collective will, not just of the people of, 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 of Libya in this case, but the international community to back the voices that are demanding change in a more liberal political space so that these ideals that are now being put into constitution can actually have a life in the politics and economy and social life of that country. Right, thank you. Um, and one other question here. Uh, are you aware of the Centers of Peace and Conflict Studies of Rotary International? I have heard of those Centers of Peace and Conflict Societies all over the world. Yes, I do. And we do have a Center for Peace and Conflict Studies here at McMaster, you know, pardon the shameless plug. Um, and and uh, we've, we've had opportunity to attend a few of uh, conferences that either have been hosted by Rotary Centers for Peace and, and Conflict, uh, but also some of the research that have come out of that initiative. That's great. And I'm happy to share um, some information with our viewers in my follow-up email about that at the center here at McMaster as well, um, as long as, uh, as well as some information on the uh, sustainable development goals. Um, and I just had one last final question here. Um, you know, you're talking on a global scale, but what can people do here at home or, or locally where they are to help, um, you know, contribute to peace in society? What are some small things that people can do every day that, in your opinion, would help um, contribute? That's a very good question. I like that being the question. You hear all of this and you say, what can I do to make things uh, uh, different? Uh, when we started this, session, one of the slides that was put up talked about the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, these are the United Nations uh, goals have been itemized uh, to kind of guide uh, the global community in working towards the Sustainable Development Goal. And I've always recommended them because they distill very clearly what everyone can do. 
Uh, so in whatever sector of the global economy or the world that you belong or you, you work in, there is an SDG that speaks to what you can do in that regard. I mean, give, take an example of global warming. Uh, what can we do about global warming as local people? Hold our politicians accountable. Hold our elected leaders accountable. Ask them how their economic policies impact global warming, impacts the environment, impacts and addresses the ecological crisis. In a couple of weeks, actually next week, the leaders of the world will be gathering in Scotland, in the UK, uh, for what's called COP26, the big climate change conference. This is one of the biggest climate uh, change conferences in Israel. And, and a lot of political leaders will be there to talk about this. But what we find is that many of these political leaders meet every two years or three years, as the case may be, return home, but their policies, the budgets, the policies do not always reflect the aspirations that they espouse at these global conferences. And I think it's important for us as citizens to educate ourselves and hold our governments accountable to meet the targets that they've promised at this conference. And if they haven't promised targets that we consider realistic, to demand that they do that. I also stress that we shouldn't just be concerned about our local community. You know what they say, all politics is local? Well, that may be true, but one of the things that the pandemic has shown us is that what's happening over there ultimately affects us there. We saw with the COVID pandemic that you couldn't just say this is a local issue because it was global. And so when we ask of our political leaders questions about climate change, about poverty, about equality, about justice, we should not just concern ourselves with our local community. We should also ask how foreign policy, how development planning, how development assistance affect the lives of the most underprivileged people on the other side of the world. That's how we make change. And it doesn't have to be some big project. It can be little things, you know, asking uh, from your local, and I tell students this, this is a, a very simple one. When you go into a coffee shop, a question as simple as how is your coffee sourced? Uh, does your supplier pay a fair wage for your coffee? I know a lot of companies are now conscious of that in an age of ethical investing. Uh, they are more conscious of showing uh, they're doing right by the primary producers of this product. So a little bit more consciousness about our consumer patterns, about what we consume, who's really paying the price for all these cultures of consumption uh, that, that seem to be prevalent in our society. So it's important that we find our little ways to make these kind of interventions. That's how we make change happen. That's great. Thank you so much. And thank you for this excellent talk. That's all the time we have for today. And as one of our viewers uh, stated in the chat, hopefully we'll see some um, peace apps soon that we can all <laughs> uh, use in our daily lives as well. Um, so I just, again, wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join um, us today and speak to our group this evening. And for all of you who tuned in to join us, um, we will have a survey sent out in an email following. Uh, so if you could kindly take a minute to fill that out, we'd appreciate the feedback. Our next logger lecture will take place on Wednesday, October 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Dr. Claudia Emerson, and we'll focus on ethical, social, and cultural thinking in supporting the sustainable development goals. So if you wanna register for this talk, please visit our website at alumni.mcmaster.ca forward slash events. Thank you again, Dr. Abawal, for joining us and for everyone for tuning in this evening. Thank you.